Hey everyone. Well, today we're just going to make a real quick one. So this is the 1AR that I put camshafts in and I want to investigate the source of that rattling. So it's likely the intake VVTi. Um, and conveniently the intake VVTi we can take out without taking a whole bunch of this apart. So we're going to take that apart. We're going to explore it. Um, Quick note before we get into the meat of the video, uh, something that comes up in the comments a lot, I get asked about parts to put this kind of car together with the AR motor that we've been dealing with. I actually, if you look right here, see, this is my website, I actually sell all these parts and it makes it for a really simple swap. There's a link in the description, you can check that out. So if this swap that I've been doing here interests you, well, know that you can do it. Um, just follow the link in the description and uh, you can feel free to ask me questions over email and I'll be happy to answer them. I'm even a Haltech dealer now, so if you want to do this swap today, and right now I don't have a stock ECU solution for it, I can sell you a Haltech ECU uh, along with the tune that you're going to need to make this work. So just reach out. The other thing I wanted to cover is this video is at a bit of a slower pace because I'm actually doing the discovery on camera. I don't know if that's a good idea or not. Normally I do a bit of research just before doing the videos. If you guys prefer this more live approach, um, leave some notes in the comments. Um, also, I'll be able to check the analytics because it'll be obvious if <laughs> the audience is just completely dropping off. But if you're one of those people that wants it a bit faster pace, uh, know that the conclusion, that'll be me in a few minutes talking about everything that was discovered. All right, enjoy. I'll see you guys back at the conclusion. Um, I've actually never seen the inside of one either. I just picked up, they are, uh, five-pointed kind of Torx bolts that go in here uh, to take the assemblies apart. So I just picked these up and uh, let's explore it together. And then, you know, today's tip of the day is this. So there's a 14 millimeter hex here. I don't have Allen keys that big. Well, just take a bolt and a nut and put them together. In my case, I welded them, but if you don't have a welder, you can just smash the threads until it doesn't work anymore. And now you've turned an innie into an outie and you can just use a 14 millimeter socket to take that off. So uh, let's take this part real quick and uh, I'll see you back in a second. All right, so far everything looks good in here. Um, something to note, I have turned the engine to 90 degrees. So the pistons are all at about the same height. So it doesn't matter when I release the tension on the chain, the valves aren't gonna strike the pistons. <laughs> well, <laughs> you need to weld it a little harder than that. There it goes. Wow, that's a tight bolt. <laughs> Man, I'm glad I'm not trying to do this job while retaining the timing on the motor. This has turned into a puzzle. <laughs> These bolts are hanging it up. <clears throat> and since we got to take those bolts off anyways, why don't we just take one of them off while it's in there? Though, I'm assured this is supposed to be possible without doing that. What kind of carnage awaits us? So first question is, is it locked? You know what? It actually is locked. Well, plot thickens. It could be the exhaust too though. All right, that's weird. There's no damage to speak of on that lock pin. Yeah, I mean, it looks like it's been used, but it's not, it's certainly not what I would call worn. Well, I guess that leaves the question. Is it the exhaust or is it something entirely different? Yeah, in this seat here, you can see if you look at the seat, the forward and the backward uh, direction, they've definitely got some wear, right? Because this pin, this pin is not a perfect fit. So it's sitting there and I don't know. Now when it's all the way down, it doesn't, is the spring just not tight enough? So it, 
you know, maybe this thing's camming out a little bit, and once it cams out, it can... No, because the wear... The wear is all the way to the bottom of that bore. So if it was partially walking out, it... Wow. Let's see how... Let's see how big the spring is. How long the spring is. You know what? I, I wonder if that's the issue. That spring's only got one to two millimeters of compression before it does anything. Yeah, so right here, this is off of a 2GR, and these don't have the problem, so I'm curious to see if this has a heavier duty spring in there. That's definitely gonna be interesting to see. Because maybe it's just not, it's just having problem finding its home because that spring's too light. You know, there's tension in all of this stuff, and hmm. Well, I think it's more likely Based on what I'm seeing here though, I think it's more likely to be the exhaust than to be that spring tension. So I guess we're taking this apart a little bit further. We're gonna take the timing cover off. Hmm. I wonder how you deal with that spring. Let's see how much tension there is on it. Oh, okay. That's how you deal with that spring. Wait a second. Huh. Oh, do the channels line up? Weird. All right, so the patterns here are mirrored. That's why I didn't switch the cam over. Uh, sorry, the phaser over earlier. But when I was looking at the pictures, I didn't realize there was only one pin. I'm gonna have to map these ports here because this puts it at a different angle and see Oh, we might. This might just bolt on. Might not need any, any machining. Wow, that would be. That would be a nice thing. That would make things just a little bit easier. All right. Let's see if there's carnage in here. All right. Well, first glances, it looks good, just like the other one. But come on. Oh. Oh, huh. Okay, that pin looks like it's... That pin that holds the spring looks like it's pressed in there, but that shouldn't matter to us. Ah, okay. Got it. Oh. <laughs> These are like mini apex seals they have complete with uh, little springs. All right, so the spring has pretty much the same type of tension. So that probably means that that's not broken. It's possible that they're both broken in this motor, but probably not. And certainly nothing screaming out to me is damaged. Let's take a look at the other half. So kind of the same thing going on here. You can see it hit a little bit a couple times in there, but I mean, the thing will rattle in there a little bit. Um, and it's halfway up the bore because this one here, if you look at it again, there's quite a bit of taper at the top, um, probably to make it so that this pin can find its home a little bit easier. All right, well, the plot thickens because I'm not seeing anything wrong yet. The only thing I'm seeing that could be wrong at this point is there's not enough spring pressure. So let's take the 2GR1 apart. Oh! Oh! There's no lock pin. There's no lock pin. Look, no lock pin. Well, unless, I mean, it could be blind right here where it looks like there's a bit of a case reinforcement. I don't know, let's see if we can get this thing out of here. All right, there is a lock pin. 
And yeah, this thing is a lot stronger. This one's not meant to be disassembled nearly as easily though. I really want to see that spring. Uh, I think we're just going to have to sacrifice this, uh, sacrifice this actuator. Give me a second. Let me open it. All right. Had to cut it apart, but check this out. This is the spring in the AR that constantly has problem. And this spring here is in the GR. Um, hmm. Actually, I've got an idea. I'll be right back. All right, well, apparently a search for some carnage is gonna lead to some exploration here. I, I wasn't expecting that this is where this video was gonna go, but here we are, so let's do it. Um, this is what I use for testing valve springs. Uh, it's just a little setup that I made to hold a dial indicator in my mill, and I can go up and down and control really precisely what my squish is, and then I can read out the weight. Now, when I'm doing valve springs, I use my shipping scale here, which is good for 300 pounds. This isn't good for quite as much weight, but it'll actually read down to grams. And as you can see here, we're actually picking up the weight of the spring inside the dial indicator, which I wasn't expecting because normally I'm using this thing to measure hundreds of pounds. So we're gonna have to go back and cancel that out. But so we're just gonna pull this one under here we're going to put it at the right place and we can measure its travel and its weight all right Let's zero ourselves out and we're going to zero this out also And let's see, so as soon as, yeah, okay. I think this is where we're gonna find the big difference here. So I've gone down, what, 12 thousandths of an inch? Well, here, let's go down about a millimeter. It's about a millimeter. So at one millimeter. Now we're gonna have to cancel out this here. Uh, we're at effectively 500 grams, but that's not all the way in. Actually, that's barely in at all. So let's go to two millimeters. That's going to be 560. Oh, okay. I got to be careful here. When I push on here, it's okay. Yeah, that's fine. Oh, that's okay. Full travel is pretty much exactly six millimeters. That makes sense. Engineers usually pick nice round numbers when they can. So six millimeter is near as makes no difference. 800 grams. Okay. Now that's 800 grams with this, but we have to take out the weight of that. So let's see. So what that's telling us is this one right here, the one that doesn't have an issue, is 745 grams when it's at rest. And importantly, when it's fully seated, um, oh, actually we didn't, oh yeah, actually, no, there's going to be zero because we zeroed that out. So minus zero. When it's fully seated, it's sitting at 500 grams. Now I think especially the fully seated pressure we're going to find is very different on this one. And then we're going to go compare ramp angles because that's going to affect things also. Thankfully, I've got a machine to do that. All right. And the travel was the same. So we can assume these numbers up here, minus 55 grams. So 400 grams. All right, let's go inspect the 
ramp angle before we do anything else. All right, so what we've got here is my optical comparator. I'm just going to zero this guy out on the uh, top of this cap here, and then we're going to measure its angles. And I'll bring you guys in here in a second so that you can see what I'm seeing. All right. All right, and now with the lights off, you can see I've got the top of that set to zero. So we're just going to go figure out what this angle is because that affects the leverage in the system. And we can see six, okay, about six and a quarter degrees for the ramp angle on the AR. And let's figure out what the ramp angle is on this guy. So again, we got a zero our world. Okay, you know what? I mean, as expected, these are machine surfaces. The zeros are both the same. So let's go back to that uh, six and a quarter degrees. Okay, yeah, all right. So the mechanical advantage is the same on the other ones. All right, let's get out of here and go talk about what we figured out. All right, well, <laughs> that was a lot more interesting than I would expect it to be. Um, I was really just expecting to open that up and find a bunch of carnage, but instead I found this and actually I did a bit more looking. Um, you can see here, this one here is the exhaust in the AR and this is the intake in the AR and it's actually even shorter on the intake side. What we had measured was the uh, exhaust so the intake has almost no preload whatsoever when it's at the bottom of the hole. And if we compare that, let's see if we line up the bottoms to the GR one, this and the holes are about the same depth. Like this has, you know, 500 grams of preload. So the big difference is the two GR one, even when it's sitting bottomed in the lock pin has 500 grams of preload. Whereas this one, let's see, this intake one has, yeah, about 180 grams of preload. And if you combine that with, I, I was talking to a Toyota engineer, um, not somebody that's responsible for designing this stuff, but you know, word gets around when they're inside. And what he told me is, you know, the, the engine is old. To them, this is an engine they developed back in 2006. So nothing was fresh in his mind, but he seemed to remember that thicker oil made the problem worse. And at the time that I heard that, that made zero sense whatsoever because why would, why would thick oil make a problem? Um, I would imagine if anything, thick oil would reduce that noise as it's slamming around there. But what I think is happening here, let me go grab the gear real quick. So yeah, so what I think it comes down to is just this, this little guy here, it's got that six and a quarter degree ramp angle. So whenever there's any torque applied, this thing will try to ramp out of that hole. Now it has to have that because otherwise it would never find its home. But since there's no preload as it as it pulls out a little bit, every time it tries to push one of those cams, it can't make it all the way back down because the heavy oil is stopping it. And you know, this thing's only got 190 grams of preload. And the reason the 2GR never does it is because the 2GR sitting in the hole, I mean, it, it's a whole pound of preload. <laughs> yeah. So right here, this is the next thing we're going to need to do. I'm going to need to buy probably 35 cents worth of springs. Well, actually no, because I'm probably going to have to get custom wound springs. So it's probably going to be $20 worth of springs. And uh, that should solve our rattle. And now that I've had a bit of time to examine this further and think about it, I can see that my conclusion was correct. It is the spring pressure that's the issue, but the engineering constraints into the solution is a lot more complicated than I initially thought. And it's all because of this plate right here. So this is the assembly here, the, you've know, got the chain and then the actual 
rotational piston assembly and then this plate and so if you look at this assembly a little bit closer you can see this here's where the pin goes and do you see this little channel here that lines up with this little hole right there and what that means is when this thing is parked this pin is not working on the differential pressure between both sides of the solenoid this pin is working on one side of the solenoid and just the crankcase pressure the reason that's a problem is the vvti solenoids are not perfect seals they're it's made to be a valve that can move back and forth really quickly so that the ecu can pulse width modulate it and actually set the position so this thing here when it's sitting like this it's leaking it's leaking into it you know through all, all four of those ports there and it's leaking out of it but that means now because we're leaking out here and we're comparing the differential pressure not between the two ports the more that valve is leaking the more that your solenoid is going to be a problem so if you've got a car that's rattling the first thing i would do is not because it's more likely to be the issue but because it's the easiest fix by far i would pull the vvti solenoids out and i would look for any kind of scratches or anything um, it's potentially also worth pulling the valve cover off to see into the ports to see if there's scratches or anything in there because i think scratches in there would definitely make this problem significantly worse and if we compare it to the 2GR valve, it's a little harder since I had to destroy it. So this valve here, you can see it's still got the leak path around here, but, and I had to destroy this part. Essentially, it's, it's balancing the lock pin based on both sides of this channel. So as long as the leak is roughly equal, it won't matter. You know, if there's 50 PSI on both sides of it, it still won't move. So when the solenoid moves to tell it to, to actually start actuating that, it's gonna be a much more decisive click. That combined with the heavier weight on the spring, it's just gonna work. Now, unfortunately, if you look at this drive, like there's no way, there's no, at least no simple way to retrofit this onto the AR. So now there might be something else in the family that we can use and I will keep looking, but I, I don't think there's going to be at this point. The other big complication comes from, you see this spring here? This spring pushes against this plate, which doesn't seem like a problem at first, but this plate here, it stays, you see it's bolted through the outside here. It doesn't rotate with the piston. So that spring has to sit here and slide back and forth on here and that severely limits the aspect ratio of the spring because let's say you have a longer spring so this spring right here you can see right it just if you put some pressure on it it just wants to buckle if you do this then you know this spring it's pretty resistant to buckling even if you're you know squeezing it at odd angles and that has everything to do with the aspect ratio of the spring and the number of turns and there's really a plane and that has everything to do with the aspect ratio of the spring but the reason that that's a problem is that prevents us from putting the correct design in there that it really needs this piston right here let's see if i can pull it apart it's essentially a two-stage piston so you can see when it's sitting parked you know with this in here this ring right here blocks part of this piston area so the oil pressure can't push on it as hard but then as soon as it cracks open you get the whole effective area of that piston and if your pressure is set appropriately then as soon as it cracks open it's going to snap all the way and there's no there's no possibility for this to stay kind of halfway in or anything and that's great that prevents a bunch of wear unfortunately to do that you need a long aspect ratio of spring <laughs> and a long aspect ratio spring wants to buckle and because it wants to buckle and the back surface is not something that's moving with it in fact it has to it's it's just going to make the buckling significantly worse so we can't do this so what i did instead is i went with this spring here and you can see no matter what well you can't really see no matter what though it won't buckle the aspect ratio of the spring is such that it's not a problem at all now that was the intake pin and 
that's great and all, but then the exhaust pin to make things worse, you can see it's even smaller. So I have to use a smaller spring. That made things a little bit compli more complicated, but if you, you, know, you pick an appropriate spring, something slightly smaller diameter, you can end up with the same thing where it just doesn't want to buckle. So in the end, this is the solution that I've got. It's a different spring for the intake versus the exhaust. And as best I can tell, these are not going to collapse. The spring pressure is quite a bit more to release, but it should still be less pressure than it takes to actually move the actuator. So, so it's not like it's going to be sitting there trying to rotate it. And then all of a sudden, as soon as the pin extracts, then it shifts 10 degrees. In this case, it should still eject the pin, have enough oil to control things, and then start moving. Uh, the other thing I noticed, I went back and looked at the stock tunes and the AR on none of the tunes that I have. So I have a couple Camry tunes, some Scion TC tunes, and uh, I think a Venza tune. Um, I don't have the Highlander or the Sienna, but on all of those tunes, I noticed none of the VVTI tables ever went between zero and five degrees. It always went from zero to five degrees to make sure that that lock pin unlocks decisively. Um, I'm going to have to edit the Haltech tune on here because I've got a couple points where it is going in that region. And I think that's just probably asking for wear, right? Because since it can't snap back and forth like that, it can fall into the hole every time it goes to zero degrees. And that's, that's just not good. So zero to five degrees is just not going to be allowed in the tune. Now that's going to be a bit tricky because I've got some tables in there that when the engine is coming up to temperature, it doesn't use the full VVTI range, but there's a point where it starts using it. So I'm going to have to be smarter about the tables in there, not just to be temperature dependent, but also to be target dependent. So if it's going for five degrees, no matter what the engine temperature is, if it allows it to go beyond zero, it should allow it to go all the way to five degrees. But I don't want to just make my numbers bigger because then that would eliminate my ability to go to five degrees when it is fully up to temperature. So that's going to be fun. Uh, thankfully, the Haltech ECU is very configurable, and I don't think that's going to be an issue at all. So at this point, we've got an untested solution that really should work. Um, I'm not going to put it up for general sale on the website because I want people to fully understand what the limitations are. But if you're in a situation where you've got a rattle, you're doing your own work, and you're willing to give this thing a try, then feel free to reach out. Um, I had to get these springs custom made, so I've got a whole pile of them. Um, and uh, I'll sell them for $25. Now, I will sell them for $25 on the website once this is fully tested. So if this is in the future, uh, go check in the description. You can see my website there, and uh, under the 2AR motor stuff, you'll be able to see these springs there, assuming that it's been properly tested. Which means at this point, we've got all the issues on this motor solved, um, at least until we create more for ourselves. Uh, I think the next build I'm going to do, I'm going to take a 2.7 liter, I'm going to take the 12 and a half to one compression ratio. I, I might actually drop it down to 12 to one. I haven't made a final decision on that. And I'm going to go for some cams that are somewhere in between the two cams that I've tried, probably closer towards the 280s that I had originally, but with a steeper initial ramp angle. And with that, I expect the, the math shows that we'll get to 320 horsepower. Now, the math is always <laughs> a bit too generous. So let's say that we're going to strive for 300 horsepower. I'm not guaranteeing that we're going to get there, but we'll definitely get beyond the 270 from the previous 2.7 liter because we're going to be on very similar cams. We're going to have the increased compression ratio, which gives us the increased efficiency at high RPM. And we're going to get our 8% extra air back. So yeah. Yeah, probably right around that 300 horsepower number and that would be pretty awesome. So, so that's it for now. Uh, I'm gonna have to send off to get some cams made. That's gonna take a little bit. So there's probably not gonna be an AR video for a while. So that means I guess <laughs> I'm gonna have to make an exhaust for the Widowmaker. I really hate making headers. <laughs> uh, all right, well, it doesn't matter. I'll see you guys in the next video. Have a great day, bye.